worrying about it, you might want to write are different than all our other mammals in the way we mentioned before. Why, how are they different or why are they different? Because they're not mammals. They don't miss you. They're not mammals at all. They don't I said, an, I meant animals, yeah. They don't have tissues. Right, they have no <laughs> tissues. Okay, but they do have what? Good. All right, the, the body, the, and they have asymmetry. Sometimes they are radial. And if you were to uh, draw one, they generally have this kind of, um, this body form. It's not really a body, I guess, but. Um, and they are marine, right? They live in marine environments. I think there are some fresh water, but they're in the water at least. Um, and the way that they're, um, the way that they get their nutrients is through currents, so they're filter feeders. Okay, so they have these holes called ostia. And then they have this big hole in the top called an osculum. And what happens is as the current passes over the top of it, that creates a negative pressure and it sucks water then into the ostia and inside of them. And as water goes through it, it filters out organisms and other things that that it can eat, okay? Okay, so if we were to do a cross section here then, this is this is an ostia here. All right, and what you have is our specialized cells which form the hole or the pore, and they're called porocytes. Okay, um, they then also have these little um, They look like coanoflagellates, but these are actually coanocytes or collar cells. And they have these little flagella. And the flagella beat against the current and also can help create a current if there's no current. Okay. What's that? Can the coanocytes look like cells, or do you have to match the um, They will create a little larva that lives by itself. Um, but yeah, no, the coanocytes cannot live by themselves. Okay, they also within here have um, uh, epidermal cells. I'm just going to draw a couple over here. And then within this matrix, um, they have spicules, which are made of silicone. Okay, so this is just giving structure to the sponge uh, matrix which is within it, and also makes it harder to eat. So when something tries to eat it, it has these spicules in it. It's not. Silicone oh. based. All right, and then there's one other cell type I'm going to draw in here, and this is basically an undifferentiated 
amoebocytes. They kind of look like an amoeba. And they can become uh, coanocytes, or they can become a porocyte. They're kind of like a stem cell. Um, I mean, just in the fact that they differentiate into these other different types of cells. I'm not sure about research done on them. But. So stem cells are like, you know, our body cells which become our specialized cells. That would be the equivalent of, of that in a sponge. Okay, so those are peripherins. Any questions? Okay, what clade do they belong to? Metazoa, okay. The phyla is periphera, good. They do not have true tissues, but they do have specialized cells. Okay, so that's the first branch on our phylogeny, right? Edgar over here on our peripherins as well. So the Edicarian biota had body forms which looked mostly just like sponges and cnidarians. Very soft bodied, um, asymmetrical or radial symmetrical um, organisms. Cut it down. Hmm? The clade is metazoa, yeah. Okay, our cnidarians um, then are. In the eumetazoa, the, everything, everything else is in eumetazoa, but this is the basal group within eumetazoa. And they do have two tissues. They are diploblastic, so they only have two embryonic germ layers, which become their, the tissues in their body. There are two different body forms uh, in cnidarians. They can be a medusa, which is the free-floating Life, or life form, body form. And these are your jellyfish, right? This is what you think of floating around in the ocean. Um, but there are also polyps. So polyps will attach to a substrate, attached to a rock. Um, and other than that, they have very identical structures. Okay, so um, they're just kind of flipped upside down in relation to each other. So here is the mouth. Okay, surrounded by uh, tentacles. Um, it Wallows things, ingests things into its mouth, and it goes into its gastrovascular cavity. Okay, I'm going to put GC here. Its outer layer, then, is the epidermis. And then this layer, which forms the gastrovascular cavity on the inside, is the gastrodermis. All right, within the tentacles, they have a specialized cell, which has a little barb in there with a poison. Okay, um, these are called nematocysts.
The nematocyst is the structure, and then the stinging cell is called the nidocyte. Okay, so the nematocyst is the structure. Within the nematocyst is the nidocyte, which has the stinging cell. That's what actually injects the poison into whatever it's, whether it's food or for defense. And these can be deadly. Okay, so those are the parts of the Nigerians. Now there are four groups then within there. And uh, the groups within there are generally Medusa or polyp dominated in their life cycle. Some species, they can be both, but are generally one or the other. Um, so our, see how this works. our anthozoans, which are the corals and anemones, They are mostly polyps, right? So they attach with substrate and they stay there for most of their life cycle. Okay, we mentioned our um, true jellies. They are scyphozoans. And technically, you're not supposed to call them jellyfish because they aren't a fish at all. So you call them jellies? Yeah, that would be the more technical term. Okay, and then there's also cubozoans. Yeah, box or cube jellies. And they just look like jellyfish, but they're more cube-shaped. Got like kind of angular um, medusas. All right, and then the last group, hydrozoans. What are the first type of jellies called again? True jellies, scyphozoans. Hydrozoans are our sea fans. And they aren't dominantly one or the other, so they can be in either group. Okay, so I drew them under here, whether they are polyp dominated or Medusa dominated or both. All right, any questions there? Okay, so that's the next branch on our phylogeny. We've got tissues. What clay do they belong to? Uh, Eumetazoans. Good. And how many um, how many embryonic germ layers do they have? Two. So they are diploblastic. Two. All right, so we've got it on there already, right? It's all making sense. It's all coming together. All right, so the Cnidarians and the Peripherans, okay, these were much like the original animals, the first ones that formed, the first ones that evolved, okay? And what, um, what do we call these first, you know, when we did the timeline, what were the first um, animals called? Okay, so that they were part of the Edicarian. Biota, right? Okay, and what era was that from? Proterozoic. Neo, good job. Get the Neo down. All right. Okay, so Platyhelminthes, this is our first bilateral group that we're going to talk about. 
Okay, if they're bilateral, um, also how many embryonic tissue layers do they have? Three. Three. So they are triploblastic. Okay, what are those three layers? A little review with this. Endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Right, so endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Good. All right, um, all right, there are a few different groups we talked about. Planarians, which are these free-living flatworms. And these are a model organism used in a lot of developmental studies. And you can do a lot of cool things with planariums. planarians. They, are, they have these weird heads with eye spots. And you can do things like cut their head in half, and then that head will grow two heads on the same body, or you can, you can do all sorts of weird stuff like that. Um, we could, maybe. They're also really small, but uh, a lot of the scientific literature on development has looked at planarian um, biology. Okay, there's also trematodes, which are called, uh, include some parasitic flukes, which will cause uh, diseases. And tapeworms, okay, which are also parasitic. All right, so we're going to draw a little bit about the um, body form of tapeworms. So they have these repeating segments called proglottids. And they basically just have indeterminate growth. As long as there's enough nutrients, they'll just keep growing more and more of these proglottids which is why they can get so long and clog up people's digestive tracts, okay? But their head, their head has different structures, okay? So it has these suckers, which it uses to attach to the intestinal wall. And then it also will have hooks, okay, also to kind of just stay attached. And some of them may just have suckers and some of them may just have hooks, okay. But this, um, this top part is called the scolex, okay. Now to get rid of tapeworms, um, there's medicines you can take that will kill the tapeworms in your digestive tract. But to check, you actually have to look at your feces and check for proglottids. And if you check for a certain amount of time and you don't have proglottids in there, then you're considered tapeworm free. Okay, but you have to check over time because these can separate off and create new tapeworms and it's a big mess. And if you just get half of the tapeworm and the, that sucker is still on there, then it can just start all over again. Um, so physically removing tapeworms, um, although probably will clear up your digestive tract, probably won't get rid of them in your body. Yeah, I'm sure you guys, if you've served in a third world country, you might have some stories about those guys. All right, uh, mollusks. Okay, there's another, these are our, all right, so we've talked about bilateria, bilateria uh, but they're also in other clades as well, right? So what, what were the other ones? What type of development do they have? No, they're not deuterostomes, we skipped over those. They're actually, protostomal development, and they're in the Lophotrochozoans, okay? as are the flatworms. Oh. All right, we've got four groups of mollusks. Okay, these are mostly marine, okay? The chitons are, they have this body form where they have eight dorsal plates. 
Okay, and then they have a muscular foot underneath it. All right, has anyone gone to tide pools and looked at all the funny organisms there? Okay, a lot of, you should be able to find chitons if you go to tide pools. It's more of a West Coast thing. East Coast doesn't have fun little tide pools like West Coast does, but you can find these just sticking to the rocks. Um, and they just eat algae pretty much um, off of that grows on the rocks. It's similar, it's the same sort of thing. It has a muscular foot, but it just creates a suction cup, essentially. And then its dorsal plates adhere to the, um, to the rocks or whatever. Okay, gastropods. Uh, these are snails and slugs. And they have a peculiar um, body development where they have torsion. So essentially, this is my slug, have his mouth here, the digestive system is twisted So its anus is actually positioned dorsally above its mouth. So it has to be careful when using the bathroom. So do bats. Think about it. Okay. Um, all right, bivalves, that literally means, well, it doesn't mean shells, but it has two shells. Okay, so these are, they have one shell, they have another shell, and then their muscular foot can be projected out of there. Okay. And they have a body plan similar to snails and slugs and chitons. Um, they create, they make these shells made out of calcium, um, but they are totally enclosed in their shell, unlike the other organisms. All right, cephalopods then, these are octopi, squid, and Nautilus. And the octopi do not have a shell. Okay, the, all the other organisms have at least, well, slugs don't have shells. But um, the squid and the Nautilus, the squid has an internal shell, the Nautilus has an external shell. And this group, all of them can squirt ink as a defense mechanism. And octopi are also the most intelligent invertebrate. Okay, they can unscrew things. Um, they have a number of defense mechanisms. They can use like coconut shells to hide. They have camouflage, lots of other cool things. Yeah. Do you see the octopus that in the World Cup where they pick every single team goes to win and the knockout stages? Oh, really? Why don't they get two trees with the flag of three teams that are going to play and you pick the right team every time? Wow, see, that's smart. <laughs> <laughs> that's not random. It's not that hard. Does he watch a lot of soccer? It's only like one goal, it's not that hard. <laughs> All right, so those are mollusks, very diverse group, mostly marine. Uh, tripoblastic, lophotrochophores with protostomal development. Okay, annelids are our segmented worms.
All right, it's segmented mean they also they have a repeating um, units. Okay, they also have. Um, These projections called parapodia. Okay, so it's not quite like a foot, but it's a little sticky outy thing, right? And we've got two groups within annelids, polygic polychaetes and oligochaetes. The keat refers to these hair-like projections which come out of the parapodia. Polychaetes, poly means what? So they have multiple chete, which come out of their parapodia. And oligochaetes have what does oligo mean? It means few, but they only have one. Oligarchy, rule of the few, right? So this is few kite. Okay, uh, an example of an oligo kite is an earthworm. Um, and then a polychaete. Well, I don't really have a good example of that, but. Those tube worms that you saw in the lab, those were polychaetes. All right, leeches also belong to this group. <clears throat> they are oligochaetes as well. And they have these hydrostatic skeletons, which means their skeletons are made of basically water, they're moving water throughout their body. That allows them to be really flexible and suck your blood. Okay. Um, arthropods. So now we're skipping down to a new clade. Okay. They are in ecdysozoa. So what is ecdysis again? They molt. They molt. They shed. Okay. <clears throat> And there's, I have four groups here within Arthropoda, and they have slightly different uh, body <coughs> plans. Okay, chelicerates are spiders, ticks, arachnids, <coughs> and other things. Um, they have two major divisions in their body, a head, well, more specifically called a cephalothorax and an abdomen. Okay, so you look at a spider, you can see it has a head and then it has the body. And that's pretty much it. But they're named after these uh, projections out of their cephalothorax called chelicerae. Um, and they also have those characteristics which you think of as spiders, like they have eight legs. And spiders have a lot of other unique things about it, but we won't go into that. So that's what you need to know for close rates. All right, myriapods. These also have uh, um, a head generally with some, some mandible parts and then repeating uh, body parts. All right, so these include centipedes and millipedes. A millipede has more than one leg per body segment, usually two. And then a centipede has one leg. Uh, 
Uh, millipedes are mostly harmless, eat um, dead, decaying stuff. Centipedes are generally carnivorous and can be poisonous. So if you find a mill, the, there's tons of millipedes you go out in the woods, they're like black and they have red on them. They're harmless. Um, you can find centipedes if you roll over logs. They are, I haven't tried to pick one of them up, but they probably can inject you with a very painful bite. All right, hexapods. Okay, these are your insects and relatives. All right, they have a head, abdomen, and thorax. I know I spelled head wrong. I'm going to fix it. <laughs> your heed. Huge heed. All right, head, thorax, abdomen. And they have six legs. And what has made insects so success successful is what? What do you think has made? Why are there so many insects in the world? What can they do that other organisms can't? Hide. Hide. <laughs> okay, lay dormant. It's not that. They can. Yes, but that's not it. Okay. Also, not, it has to do with their body form. I haven't drawn it yet. They can fly, right? They have wings. And because they have wings, they can go places that other people can't. Well, other animals can't, I guess. Insects are people, too. <laughs> All right, our last group, which is also very diverse, are the crustaceans. And they have a very specific body form as well with a head and abdomen. And what has made them very uh, successful is Uh, diverse appendages, right? So they have uh, legs for walking. They can have more than six. They have tons of legs. They can have these big old claws. That's a claw, as you can tell. Okay. <laughs> um, they also have gills. Okay, so most crustaceans are in the ocean. We dealt with a crustacean in lab earlier, uh, in, which was the little pill bugs, right? Sow bugs. Okay. They also have gills, but it's it's internal. It's enclosed. Um, but they still. But it is surrounded in water, which is why they are dependent on water. They have to stay in moist environments to live. Um, they and and yeah. So they have lots of different appendages. So um, a lobster or a crab or uh, a crayfish. They have these big pinchers, they have all these other legs, they have um, projections off their tail that can also help them swim and move different directions. And so that's allowed them to diversify within the water environment. Finally, the last one we're going to talk about is the echinoderms. We're not going to talk about chordates because that's what we're going to talk about on Wednesday, and we'll talk about the diversity of the groups within chordates. Echinoderms, um, these are deuterostomes, right? So they have deuterostomal development. And they also have a water vascular system. which is what I've drawn here. And um, 
at the end of the water vascular system, they have two feet. And these project outside of their spiny skin uh, into their arms. Okay? Echinoderms also have the pentaradial symmetry. So I only drew one of these, uh, one of the ends of these water vascular system, but they have five of them. Okay, and what happens is when they want, to project uh, a tube, the ampulla will contract and that will push the tube foot out further. And then it will secrete one substance for for adhering to something, so to stick to something. And a different, I guess we'll say anti-adhesive, when it wants to let go. Okay, as this ampulla contracts, it forces water through this system. And so water, if it needs to be replenished, will go then through the madreporite, down these radial canals, and then out the tube feet after it's done its whatever work it needs to do. So these, uh, at least like sea stars, are generally carnivores. And the, what the tube feet allow them to do is to essentially pry open things which are normally inaccessible. So bivalves, which are, you know, have a pretty strong muscular foot which closes their two shells, um, they take their little tube feet and they can squirt their tube feet into the in between them and essentially pry them open. And then they can also squirt digestive enzymes out these um, same openings, kill whatever is in there, and then eat whatever's in there. So they are, uh, they don't look very vicious, but they are actually a top predator in the marine uh, environment. Um, and they also have uh, fragmentation regeneration. Um, so if, they, if this guy gets cut and at least some of that central disc is preserved, that one leg of the sea star can regenerate five other legs and it can become another five-legged sea star. Um, Yeah, they can kind of yeah, they can do that as well. Yeah, so you can cut one in half and it'll grow two new ones. But but yeah, um, in our phylogeny as well. All right, at some point we had the um, split then. And the formation of tissues. And this clade is now eumetazoa. What does you mean? New. True or new? Yeah, so these are our true metazoans. And they have, unlike our peripherans, Tissue. tissues. Okay, and what's a tissue? Yes. So it's a group of specialized cells with the same function. In order to have a tissue, you have to have specialized cells. Um, but you also have to have different functional systems. Right? These tissues belong to. All right, and our basal group in the eumetazoans are our cnidarians. Starts with a C. Yes. And they have, they are diploblastic. What does that mean? 
<laughs> Do they only have two blastics? All right, yes. Okay. Right. So in gastrulation, right, that process, uh, they only have an ectoderm and an endoderm. They don't have a mesoderm. So they only have two embryonic tissue layers. Okay. Okay, everything else in our animals belongs to the clade bilateria. So our bilateral animals, they aren't all bilateral, but mostly they are. And they are triploblastic. Okay, and then they also have bilateral symmetry for the most part. Yeah. Can you zoom up a little bit on all? All right, our bilaterans um, then split into a few different clades. Okay, the first one we're going to do is the one we belong to, Deuterostomia. Okay, which has, I'm just going to put DD here, deuterostomal development, okay, which we already learned about the intro to animals, right? And the two phyla which belong to deuterostomia are chordata. And does anyone know what the other one is? C, stars, and relatives? Hakuna Matata. Okay, good. Echinoderms and chordates are deuterostomes. Um, and I must, I'm going to at this point just say, these phyla we're talking about right now, these aren't are the, all the phyla. These are just major phyla we're going over. So there are other phyla that would kind of squeeze in different parts here, but we're just not going to go over them. Okay, so of the nine phyla that we're going to go over, this is where they fit in the phylogeny. All right, so if these guys have deuterostome development, we have another branch then that has, I'm going to put PD here, a protostomal de development. But they actually don't split into, they aren't one clade, they actually split into two clades. Okay. This is a big word on this one, but this is Lophotrochozoa. Lophotrochozoa. Yep. L O P H O T R O C H O Zoa. Lophotrochozoa. You spelled it differently in the video, too, like twice. Well, well, I don't count off for spelling, so. <laughs> and that's why. I think this is the correct way, though. Lophotrochozoa. Okay. They have a larva that's either a lophophore or a trochozoa. That's why it's called lophotrochozoa. Okay? I don't know how you write. Let's, let's just put L or T larva.
And we've got three groups, there's actually more in there here, but three groups that we are covering in this clade. Loaf of four or a troch of four, whatever. Good, our flatworms, our mollusks, and annelids, okay? All right, our last clade now is Ecdysozoa. And they go through a process called ecdysis. Okay, what's ecdysis? What's that? Nope. It's shedding. Okay, so they grow by shedding. Uh, they aren't the only ones that go through like this, but all of them do. Yeah, and crabs belong to this group. We have arthropoda, and crabs are an arthropod, and nematoda. Okay, now you don't at the end here, it doesn't matter if arthropod is on top or nematode is on top. It doesn't matter where those three are in relation. So if I wanted to draw, if I wanted to write nematode here and arthropod here, that's fine. It doesn't matter. This is one of the two phylogenies which will definitely be on the test. One of the two will be on the test. Yes? Like, do we need to know the same such as, like, ecdysis or all people, whatever the word bank? No. Infinite word bank. No, no, no word bank. Okay. 